called All My Friends Are Insects. Okay, well, yes, here we are. Welcome to lab. I am Dr. Dodd, and this is Morty, my assistant. Um, Morty, go over there for a minute. Go over there, Morty. Okay, thanks. So this week for lab, we are going to talk about my favorite animal phylum, and that is the arthropods, phylum arthropoda, and I'm super excited. So get your lab notebooks and your uh, arthropod-like headgear. I had to wear my mantis headgear specifically for this, specifically for this. I had to bring in my hexapod friends. So get your lab notebook if you don't have it already, and we are going to go through exercise 39. Okay, I'm going to make two videos. So this is the first video of two so that the file sizes are small enough and it's just easier. And if you need to, you can watch them at different times. So that's how it's going to work. All right, cool. So let me bring up my virtual classroom. Okay, here we are. Welcome, friends. So we're going to go through the arthropods and we're going to talk specifically about four subphyla. Okay, yay! And if I get time, I really want to take you out in my yard and maybe look for some arthropods. Okay, so let's pull this up. Beautiful. Oh, it's already up on your screen. Okay, never mind. So let's jump right in. Phylum Arthropoda. So where do they get their name? Well, I will tell you. Arthro comes from the Latin, it means jointed, and poda, which you've heard a million times already, I think, um, refers to feet or actually appendages, so feet, appendage, uh, so together that is jointed appendages, jointed feet. So one of the hallmarks of phylum arthropoda is that they have jointed appendages. <laughs> So that's one of that's actually an easy way to remember one of these really important characteristics is it's in their name. They have jointed like arthro, arthritis, right? You've probably heard of that being inflammation of the joints. So arthropoda, that was one of the big innovations in the arthropods, that jointed appendages, because it allowed for greater um, greater freedom of movement. And since you had greater freedom of movement, you could disperse more and exploit new and different environments and go where no animal has gone before. Yeah. Okay, so three big prominent characteristics. First, jointed appendages. Second, they have a um, an exoskeleton, a chitin exoskeleton. So they have, uh, one of the hallmarks is a, a tough outer covering, essentially, that is protective of the animal. And then the third, prominent characteristic is the segmented body and the precise segmenting the the parts themselves are a little different based on the subphylum and sub sub some of the subphyla oh I can't say it today some subphyla they have a head abdomen uh, head thorax and abdomen and some have a cephalothorax and abdomen and some just have a bunch of segments. So we're gonna go through that. But one thing they all have in common is that segmented body. So it's really important to remember these three key things about the arthropods, okay? And whenever you're trying to think, is this an arthropod? You know, I always, this is not a scientific way to remember it, but you know, think of creepy crawlies, right? What's a creepy crawly? Ooh, what makes you go, ooh, right? I mean, Sure. I mean, if I met a polychaete swimming around, I would go, ooh, and that's not an arthropod, right? But arthropods are the spiders, scorpions, insects, centipedes, millipedes, all those kinds of organisms. So basically, we're talking about everything my mom calls me to come get out of her house. <laughs> okay. And here are a couple examples of arthropods, a beautiful moth here, and here a sweet little jumping spider. If you are an arachnophobe, I apologize, but this, my friend, this is the spider will not hurt you. 
and we're actually going to go through spider anatomy. And I, if you are afraid of arachnids, well, I'll tell you a little bit later. I've got a few pointers. Okay, that have nothing to do with labs, so we should move on, right? Yeah. Okay, so who are arthropods? So these are the four subphyla we're going to talk about in lab, okay? That they, they are the Chelicerata. So that includes horseshoe crabs, ticks, mites, and we're going to go through each of these in turn. I'm just giving you the big overview for today, okay? So this first video, we're going to go through the Chelicerata and the Crustacea, which you might be familiar with if you've ever heard of a crustacean. It's those guys. So lobsters, crabs, shrimp, you know, everything you would eat if you went to like a red lobster. Yeah. So this first video is going to be the Chelicera and the Crustacea. And then in the second video, we're going to talk about Myriapoda. Those are the centipedes and millipedes. And the Hexapoda, which are uh, the six-legged arthropods, which include insects. But there are, some, there are some arthropods who are hexapods who aren't technically insects. But today we're going to focus on the insects, which I love. So those are those four subphyla you'll want to remember. So let's go through each one in turn. And we're going to start with the Chelicerata. So key characteristics of the Chelicerata. Well, they have chelicerae. That's what they do. Um, so basically, these are these chelicerae are their most anterior appendages. So arthropods, these jointed appendages, uh, chelicerata have chelicerae. So these, so on a spider, if you get real close to a spider and you have these little fangs on there, they're on their chelicerae. Okay. So that's typically modified in the chelicerata. They are modified into feeding structures. All right, so this chelicerae are feeding structures. The pedipalps are the next set of appendages, and the pedipalps have a couple of, of um, functions. The first is to help them capture food, okay, because it can help them hold food, but it also serves a reproductive pup purpose because it allows uh, them to hold on to the mate during copulation. So that is. Those two um, characteristics are hallmarks of the chelicerata, so chelicerae and pedipalps. Okay. Um, other things you need to know about the chelicerata. Oh, I should also mention now, you know, pedipalps, they're important for copulating, they're important for capturing prey, but they are also, animals use them just for sensing their environment. I mean, you've probably, maybe you've seen a spider, you know, running along and it uses its pedipalps to kind of feel around. Okay, so they're incredibly important as sensory organs too. So really three big functions there, okay? Sensing the environment, copulation, and capturing prey. All right, let's also talk about um, how chelicerate bodies are organized externally because they're a little bit different from the other arthropods, okay? So here, your, your lab notebooks tip mainly refer to these parts of the body as this is in, um, as here in the parentheses. So really, you only have to worry about that, okay? But they do refer to, they're also called the prosoma and epistosoma, just so you know. So in chelicerates, the body is divided in two, where the front part of the body or the anterior part of the body is the cephalothorax, okay? So head thorax, right? So all together here, and then the abdomen is at the posterior end of the animal, all right? So if I were to ask you, what makes a chelicerate a chelicerate? You'd say, well, it has chelicerate for feeding. They're modified appendages for feeding. They have pedipulps, pedipulps for sensing the environment, copulating, and capturing prey. And their bodies are divided into a cephalothorax at one end, and the anterior end, and an abdomen at the posterior end. So that's an overview of the chelicerates. Now, you're gonna have to know a couple of classes of chelicerates. Let's recall how we organize taxonomic addresses. That's what I call them in my class, taxonomic addresses, okay? So when I say that, I mean essentially an animal's taxonomy. So 
we talk about we are in the animal kingdom, right? Well, let's back up even more, right? We're in the domain eukarya, right? That's where we're at for the rest of the semester, eukarya. And then we're in the animal kingdom, right? We're in animalia the rest of the semester. And so now we've come down through the phylum, arthropoda. So kingdom, phylum, arthropoda. Now subphylum is calicerata, and then class, meristomata. And I taught my class a song. Um, if you're not in my class, you might know the song, it's, and I'll just sing it for you to help you remember how things are organized. It goes, he, I can't believe I'm doing this. Kingdom phylum, class and order, family genus and species. This is the correct order from the largest to the least. So that can help you remember, see, you can, you can stop and you can go back and you can hear it again and again. I'm not singing it again. So you can remember, okay, I've got kingdom, I've got phylum, and then below that, you know, you've got subphylum in there, but then class. So now we're in class meristomata. And in class meristomata, there's this one animal you got to remember, and it is the horseshoe crab. Here's what's funny. They're not dang crabs. They're not really crabs. <laughs> They're actually more closely related to spiders. They're like the spiders of the sea. I just horrified a bunch of people, I'm sure. So class meristomata are the horseshoe crabs. So let us take a moment to look at this horseshoe crab's external anatomy, okay? So here we have, let's look at the, uh, the dorsal side here. So here is the back side. So you can see, so here you have up on this side, the cephalothorax. And these animals are called horseshoe crabs because their cephalothorax is shaped like a horseshoe, right there. Beep, beep. Okay. And then, so you have the cephalothorax, and down here is the abdomen. And one thing that's important to point out is they have a joint here so that the animal actually can kind of, if I can make it with my hands. So let's say this is my cephalothorax and this is my abdomen. It kind of moves like this. It has a joint there that can that provides some mobility. Um, and I actually think I'm going to show you, you know, um, there are some really great videos online of folks catching um, horseshoe crabs for horseshoe crab surveys to check how well the populations are doing. So I encourage you to check those out because you can actually see these organisms moving around and see how that joint works. So here's the dorsal side. We looked at the cephalothorax and the abdomen, okay? So let's look at the ventral side where it's on its, its back where we see the tummy, which that's not very scientific, oh well. So the ventral side here, so the chelicerae are here in the middle and they're a little hard to see, um, but they're basically, they're very small and around the mouth and they're used for feeding. And then these first, well, I should, well technically second appendages here, are the pedipalps, and they serve that same function I told you before, um, in especially in, in mating, because uh, the male will, it will attach himself, he'll hold on with his pedipalps to the female, and she'll basically just like, drag him around for a while, okay? Um, and he does that because these animals practice external fertilization, and so he'll hold on to her, and she'll run around, and it's you'll see two little horseshoe crabs just running around on the, in the sediments, like on top of the sediments, on the benthos, which is the bottom of a, a part of a piece of water, or water body, rather. So in intertidal communities, they will run around, link together, and the male is basically waiting for the female to release her gametes, her eggs, so that he can release his sperm into the water and fertilize. So chelicerae, because these are chelicerates, pedipalps, these here are the walking legs, okay, which they use to, well, walk, down here are the book gills, and these are used for gas exchange. So they're very important in the animal's gas exchange. And then here you have the telson. The telson is, is hard, um, and it looks spiny, but it's not, it's not a stinger. Some people often sometimes think that the horseshoe crab's telson is a stinger, and it's not. It's just a tail. It's a telson, okay? So that's what that is, all right? Now, 
I, I put this on here because I just thought this was adorable. This is a little girl who loves horseshoe crabs so much she dressed up as one for Halloween. So, top that. Okay, I have an arthropod. I'm in my sunroom, which is a room probably full of arthropods. And I'm hearing an insect right there. We'll go see it if it's still here um, when we finish. I'm pretty sure it's class insecta or hymenoptera, but we'll check. Okay. Family apidae, if I'm right. All right. So that is the Meristomata. All right. I wanted to tell you this too. Horseshoe crabs are really important um, in that humans actually we use their blood as in medical in the medical field so horseshoe crabs use hemocyanin in their blood to carry oxygen and you know we use hemoglobin they use hemocyanin and there's copper present in their blood so it makes it blue this is actually an operation folks will go out and get horseshoe crabs they don't drain them dry but they do take like a third of their blood and they collect it and then they release them. And there is actually quite a bit of mortality associated with that. Some of the horseshoe crabs do die, but many do recover. Um, and thankfully, so this used to be where we could only get, um, what we're looking for here is, is limulus amoebocyte lysate, which is um, basically an extract that can detect bacteria in very low concentrations. So the FDA used basically horseshoe crab blood to help in detect, detecting um, contamination. So that's really important to keep the public safe, right? And for a long time, we can only get this, it's called Limulus amoebocyte lysate because Limulus is the genus name of the horseshoe crab, okay? So for a long time, you could only get this compound from horseshoe crab blood. You could only extract it from horseshoe crab. Um, we now are able to synthesize it in a lab, so that's that's helped some with this issue. But we still do utilize horseshoe crabs to some extent for this, but they're very important for this, and it's actually a very, um, I mean, it was 50 some odd million years, or 50 some odd million dollars a year um, in terms of uh, the tests, like the, the amount of money in the medical industry that this this generated. So. It was a big, it is still a big industry. Um, but these horseshoe crabs, it's helpful to us, right? It's sad what we, we do to them. But one, the, the aim is not to kill them. The aim is just to extract a little bit of the blood. And it was to keep people safe. But thankfully, we were able to not do that so much now because we are able to synthesize that in, um, in a lab now, get that extract. And we were able to get some of those amoeba sites. And I say synthesize, we're able to, to get those amoeba sites from different places. All right. So those are the, that's Meristomata, so the horseshoe crabs. Let's move on to a new class. The one that I'm sure people are, some of y'all are going to be like, look, ooh, there's an arthropod right in front of my face. Okay. So um, these are the arachnids. If you are an arachnophobe, you're probably afraid of these. So let me point out, in the Chalicerates, horseshoe crabs, I told you they're more related to spiders than they are to crabs, crustaceans. So you'll notice if you count, you know, the walking legs, so they, um, if you count with their walking legs, they have eight walking legs. As do the arachnids, okay? So the arachnids include spiders, scorpions, ticks, mites and daddy long legs. And a lot of organisms get named daddy long legs. Um, it actually technically refers to an arachnid that is not a spider, often called a harvestman. But those are the arachnids. So let's talk about the external anatomy of an arachnid. I know some of you are like, what's well, not? Mm. But don't worry, they don't want to hurt you. In fact, arachnids, most arachnids are excellent natural pest control. All right, so let's look at, we're going to look at each of these in turn. Cool. So let's start with the scorpions. Yo, know, nobody probably gets that joke. Uh, there was a band in the 80s called the Scorpions, and they were French. Um, what's up, French? Yeah, and they they sang a song, that song, Here I am, doo-doo, 
do do rock you like a hurricane. Well, that was Scorpions. That's how they would say that. We are the Scorpions. Okay, I thought it was great. I love Scorpions. Okay, not these though. So, <laughs> so Scorpions were actually the first terrestrial arthropods. They are the oldest terrestrial arthropods. So the horseshoe crabs live in intertidal areas. They are marine. The Meristemata are marine. They live in the ocean. The um, arachnids pri uh, primarily live, you do have some aquatic arachnids, but scorpions were the first terrestrial arthropods. So they are the ancestral terrestrial arthropods, um, and they've been around a over 400 million years. Longer than my grandma. I didn't even think it was possible. Please don't tell my grandma I told that joke. So one way that we can tell that they were ancestral is they don't really have um, highly, like the fusing of the segments that you see in some of the other arthropods, they don't have that. So that is a clue about their ancestral nature, okay? So let's look at their external anatomy, shall we? Here we are. So here, up here, burp, burp. Yeah. I should get out of the way. Can you see that right there? Burp. Is each chalicera, and together they are the chalicerae, right, for feeding. The pedipalps and a scorpion are modified so that you have basically these, these claws, right, that can be used for catching prey and for defense, all right. Here, now in terms of the body segments, here and here are actually all abdomen. Most of the scorpion is abdomen. The cephalothorax is like rougher. Right there. There it is. Boom. <laughs> Let me make sure I, you can see where I'm actually pointing. Yeah, you can. Cool. Right there. That's the cephalothorax. Hmm, I'm petting a scorpion. Okay. All this is abdomen. All right. Cool. So, here we have the walking legs. All right. And then here you have right there on the dorsal end, um, in the cephalothorax that I'm petting, is the scorpion's eyes, okay? So that is the external anatomy of a scorpion. And down there at the bottom, actually, you have your stinger. I don't recommend ever being stung by a scorpion because it is incredibly painful. And um, so arachnids, yeah, that is super painful and um, not something you want to have happen. I have a friend who actually got stung by a scorpion in their bedroom. Like, clean your bedroom first of all. Okay, let's move on to the spiders. Oh, I love spiders. If you are afraid of spiders, might I suggest there is um, a video, a series of videos on YouTube called Lucas, L-U-C-A-S. Oh, I'll put it over here. Lucas the Spider. I'll put it over here on my little, um, my blackboard. Lucas the Spider. And it's just, I mean, they're just, they're cute videos of a spider. I'm sorry, it's not very scientific, but he's a jumping spider and he's very non-threatening and I he was actually very helpful um, to a few folks that I know and relieving a little bit of their arachnophobia because they saw that spiders are not just out there, you know, lurking, trying to bite you. That's not what they want to do. Okay. So let's go through the anatomy of the spider. So up here, those are the spider's chalicerae. And here, this is a lovely tarantula. So chalicerae here, sometimes, and you may see tarantula in Arkansas, they do migrate um, in the fall. So chalicerae here. So always remember the chalicerae, those first structures, those first appendages modified for feeding. And then the pedipalps are next. And then you have your walking legs, right? So your four walking legs on either side because you have eight walking legs. And then the bodies, right? You have your cephalothorax up here and then the abdomen down here, all right? And of course the spinnerets for making the web and the eyes of the spider. All right, I'm also going to show you um, ticks and mites, just so you can see how this varies across the class, um, because most of it is conserved, but they do look a little different, right? So here we have a tick on the left and a mite on the right. Um, so here on the left, the, the main thing you, I just wanted to point out here, you don't have to know all of these structures, and um, this is something that a... Uh, Somebody who actually studies ticks would probably be more interested in. But your um, the chalicerae are very small and hard to see. They're actually within the pulps, 
on the inside of the polyps. Pedip well, they're called polyps in the ticks, but they're, they are the pedipalps. So it's the same structure. So here are those, the pedipalps there, the chalicera are in here, all right? And the tick's eyes actually are on either side here. And technically this, this right over here is the tick's abdomen. And this is, it's called, it's, okay, in a tick it's called a scutum, but this is analogous to the cephalothorax. This is, a, it is a chalicerate. So this is basically the cephalothorax and the abdomen. And same, it's very close to a mite. So with the mite, let me increase the size of this a little bit so you can see. And so I told you, you know, most arachnids are terrestrial. However, there are some who are um, aquatic. So just bear that in mind. I always have students who are a little surprised when they're, they go out and collect lake water and they find mites in it. And I say, oh yes, there are, there are aquatic arachnids. And then they're like, oh no. <laughs> okay, so calicery. This, this picture does a really beautiful job with this mite. So here you can see the chalicera there, all right? And the pedipalps, it's labeled as a pulp because in the mites and the ticks, that's what it's called, um, in order acari, which is the order that the mites and ticks belong to, below um, class arachnida. You don't have to know that though. You only have to know they're arachnids. So chalicera, pedipalps, wagon legs, buddy, wagon legs right there, right? Abdomen, and cephalothorax, okay? Great. So, not too bad there with the chalicerates and their external anatomy. Mainly, you just need to know their bodies divided into two parts and those walking legs, pedipalps, and chalicerate. Okay? So, that's the big stuff with big things to know with the chalicerata. All right. You only have to know two classes. So, that's cool. All right. So, let's move on to subphylum crustacea. Subphylum crustacea is the crayfish crawdads, or the mud bugs, or whatever you call them, crabs, and shrimp. So um, here is a shrimp. Oh, man, I have to tell you something funny. My son was horrified when he learned that shrimp um, actually looked like this. He was like, wait, wait. And I was like, oh, yeah, shrimp bodies are mutilated for you to eat them. I mean, anything is, right? And he was really horrified. He still eats shrimp. Anyway, so here we have a nice little crayfish. I encourage you, you know, if you have time and you can do it, distancing from people, like I have a creek close to my house, go out and find a little crayfish and just, um, you know, become familiar with that external anatomy. I'm going to show you a few videos here, though, uh, that will allow you to see some, some feeding behaviors and how they move. And we're actually going to go through a dissection. So let's do external anatomy first. Crayfish, crabs, and shrimp, so the crustacea, or as we call them, you know, we commonly call them crustaceans, right? So they are found in marine habitats as well as freshwater habitats. You have uh, marine as well as freshwater shrimp. I could show you a very small freshwater shrimp if you ever go to Spring Creek. Uh, is it Spring Creek? Spring Mill, Spring Mill Creek, um, north of Batesville before you get to Cushman. It's full of tiny freshwater shrimp. So one hallmark of crustaceans, so remember you've got to remember these prominent characteristics, is that they're biramous. What that means is that their appendages okay, are bra double branched. So this is a biramous appendage, which is a crayfish leg. And this is just showing you a uniramous um, appendage. So that is an insect leg. So the biramous appendage is dual branched, and that is a hallmark of a crustacean. Okay. Another hallmark of crustaceans is that they have two pairs of antennae. Okay. So typically they have a longer pair of antennae and then a, sm a smaller pair that we'll call antennules. Um, but again, two pairs of antennae and bioramous appendages. Okay. So let's look at their anatomy. And now we're actually getting into the procedures in your book. So I'll kind of help you follow along here. So that is one page. Page 444. All right, that's going to show you your crayfish. I try to get as close to this this figure as possible. So, let's walk through the important external anatomy to know, and then I'm going to show you some fun videos. We'll go through a dissection, and then we'll end this video, and you can pick up with your second video when you're ready. Okay, cool. So. 
again, you have your two sets of antennae. So here's your antenna and another antenna, and then here's your antennules. Okay, cool. So these here are the chelipeds, and they're technically they're technically the first walking leg, but the chelipeds, if you've probably seen a crayfish or a crab, right? They're the claws. They're actually called chelipeds. And chelipeds serve a number of purposes. Um, again, just like in like scorpions, you have defense purposes, capturing and holding food. Um, so those are the purposes of the chelipeds. If you keep moving down here, you'll see here, it's the rostrum is pointing to the very tip here. If you looked at a crayfish, um, like a bird's eye view, it would look like very sharp there at the end. So that very sharp end um, of the carapace is the rostrum. And so, and oh, I should mention, so that carapace, we talked about it a little with the horseshoe crab, but that carapace is that strong outer covering protecting the animal. So here on the, on the, um, crayfish, the carapace is protecting the cephalothorax. So the carapace covers the cephalothorax and, pr and protects the internal anatomy of the animal. So that's the carapace. So the rostrum is the very tip, anterior tip of the carapace. Okay. Obviously you have your eyes. They're pretty easy to find. Then you've got your walking legs. So crayfish move in two ways. And one of those is they walk. And I'm going to show you a video of this just so you can see. So they use the walking legs, as you might expect, to walk. Notice, though, you have them, they're branched at the end, so biramus appendages, right? All right, so as we move down through the walking legs, and notice you don't have, so this is these are first walking legs. These guys have more walking legs than, than arachnids, okay? You have one, two, three, four, five on either side, right? Four if you didn't count the kilopeds, but we do count the kilopeds, okay? So these, um, I don't want to confuse you more, so I'm not going to tell you there's actually a special grouping we give these guys because of the number of walking legs they have. But just know that. I'm just pointing it out to you. So then as we get down here, we have the telson. You might remember that horseshoe crabs also have a telson, and that's basically their tail, right? So it's pretty easy to remember. So if you've eaten crayfish, you've eaten the muscles found in the telson, all right? And then here, out here, are the uropods. And if you were to hold a crayfish, you could actually take the uropods and move them. Okay, so there's actually joints here. So the uropods and the telson are important for the second way that crayfish move, and that is by swimming, by flicking that telson forward. So the animal, if, well, I'm going to show you a video of this, okay? So that's the dorsal view of the animal, and just to be sure, here, up here we have the cephalothorax. Down here, we have the abdomen, all right? Great. So let's look at the ventral side of the animal. We've already gone through antennules, antennae, the chelipad here, right? This, this appendage here. Now, here you can see the feeding structures a bit better. And those feeding structures are the first, second, and third maxillipeds. The maxillipeds are essentially um, modified legs for feeding, all right? So you've got three sets of them. And I'm going to show you a video of a crayfish feeding. But let's, if, let's see if I can zoom in just a little bit more to show you. So, um, and they're still a little tough to see. But your um, first, second, and this is it's in third maxillipeds are all these appendages here around the mouth, which is right here in the center. And I'm going to show you the mandible. It's tough to see in this diagram. But the mandible is right, basically right above the mouth. And it's basically, it's like a gate of, of um, a chitinous gate, very hard gate. It literally looks like this, y'all. And they as the maxillopeds are kind of shredding up food, and I'm going to show you a video of this, but they shred up food, and then the mandible's going, and it's shoving food in the mouth. It's amazing to watch crayfish eat. All right, and crabs. When we get back to campus, 
um, hopefully in the fall, please go to the beautiful marine tank that Dr. Jones and her, her students do a beautiful job of keeping up and taking care of. And you will see the happy crab when he eats. It's so beautiful and you can actually see him in action. All right, so again, we've got the walking legs, right? Now, on the ventral side of the animal is where you will find the swimmerettes. The swimmerettes are down here on the telson and they their function is reproduction. They help with the movement of, of gametes um, in, in the animal, basically. So if, if you have a male, the first swimmerettes will be very hard and uh, long and big. If you have a female, those swimmerettes will be very hair-like. And we're going to see that in just a few minutes. Okay, but down here are the swimmerettes. All right, down here in the animal is the anus. And here again, also the uropod and the telson. Okay, great. So we're going to look at the, we're going to watch this first video here. I'm going to switch to a view where you can actually see my computer screen. And the reason I do this is because I actually have an older version of um, PowerPoint. I can't get the new one and without it messing up. I tried. So I'm posting the links um, and we're going to watch them here. But I wanted to also give you the link and you can just you can go and then you can fall down a YouTube rabbit hole of crustaceans if you want. I know some of you are like, yeah, crustaceans. Okay, so here we are. Oh, let me go back just a tad. All right. So I want to show you a crayfish eating close up. That's what I'm interested in showing you. So this is a video of a nice person who um, posted their crayfish eating. So take a close look. You're going to want to be looking in this area. Here we go. Check it. What? See those maxillopeds at work? Did you see, see how fast they're moving? And if you see something moving like horizontally, that's the mandible. So here's the food being brought in. So here are the maxillopeds. All right. That is so amazing. And I'm going to skip a little because there's another crayfish over here eating as well. Just to give you another view of a crayfish eating. You see how fast the maxillopeds are moving? Oh my gosh. It's so impressive. Aww. All right. So, let's go back over here. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, I should stop that video, shouldn't I? Yes. Okay. Cool. So now, let us, I wanted to point one thing out to you. Um, I wanted to show you this picture so you could see. So this here, right here, that's the mandible. Well, this is a mandible and this is a mandible. Those are the mandibles. So they fit together like this. All right, now let's talk about sexing crayfish. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about crayfish. All right. So I know you're asking yourself, Dr. Dot. No, you're asking yourself, not me. Self, when I find a crayfish, how will I tell if it is a boy or a girl? Even though Dr. Dodd sort of just told me when we talked about external anatomy. Well, I'll tell you again. And I'll do it with pictures. So here we have the so cephalothorax, and this is the ventral side, right? Here is the telson. So here I told you the in the male, the first swimmerettes, actually it's the first two. First two sets of swimmerettes, but primarily those first swimmerettes are really hard and long and big. They are. And they're swimmerettes, okay? So, sorry, I just tickled myself. But they are, they're very prominent. So if you were to, and usually, let me just say, typically male crayfish are larger than female crayfish. But if you just grab a crayfish and you turn it over and you kind of touch the swimmerettes like this, they'll be really hard, right? Whereas these swimmerettes are more hair-like and, and um, give a lot more, 
All right, here on the female, you notice these swimmerettes are not present in the same way. Um, in fact, you have this structure here, and these swimmerettes are much, they're all hair-like in the female. All right, and notice even in this picture, the female is smaller than the male. Great. So now I want to show you um, a couple of videos of the way that crayfish move, um, and crayfish particularly, but you see in the crustacea, um, you know, shrimp move similarly, particularly with the way that they flick their tail sun. But um, crabs primarily walk because their abdomen is so reduced. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. We're just going to hang out with the crayfish for a minute. So, uh, but first I wanted to also call attention to this great crayfish who looks like he is about to drop a really bomb rap album. Um, so let us pull up the video. So here is a crayfish walking on land. So they use those walking legs for locomotion. Checking it. He's making it. Cool. All right. And then the other way the crayfish move, you may have noticed if you've ever gone swimming in a creek, they, so here is a crayfish. They flick their tails. Essentially, it's almost like if you were to do a crunch, you know, or like I'm trying to explain, think of how to tell you to move to pretend you're a crayfish. Maybe I'll show you in just a sec, but watch very closely. It's quick. So he flicks that tail sun, and those uropods assist. Oh. So basically, they swim backwards. Okay. Great. And they're ex I will say, uh, crayfish are excellent at hiding. All right, so they're flicking that telson with the Europods um, and very fast, very swift swimmers. All right, cool. So let's come back here and let's, your, your procedure on 39.1, you know, tells us to look at the external anatomy of a fray fish. Um, and one of the things that you're asked to do is to, and I'm going to read it here, arrange uh certain external anat anatom anatomical features in order and relate each one to its uh, to its function basically and so i there's a really nice diagram that i found that basically has done this virtually um that was drawn of the um the noble crayfish the noble crayfish is not a crayfish we have here in arkansas the noble crayfish is actually a european crayfish but it serves the same purpose for the um, the, what's it called? Exercise, thank you. All right, so let us start here. So your antennules, all right, and remember we have biramous appendages, so they are branched, okay? So here, um, antennule and antenna, so those are basically for sensing the environment. You have your mandible and your max, your so you have maxilla, which are feeding structures, and then maxilla pads, which are modified legs for feeding. All right, and those are all found right around this part of the animal, around the mouth. All of these, all of these are engaged in feeding and assist the crayfish in taking in food. And primarily in aquatic systems, crayfish, crayfish are kind of generalists. They'll eat pretty much whatever is lying around, but we think of them as shredders, so they'll eat decaying leaf matter, they'll eat algae, they'll eat practically anything they can get their maxillopeds on. All right, the chelopad, which is um, for defense and catch, catching things as needed. The walking legs, swimmerette, oh, walking legs, of course, are for locomotion. Swimmerettes, which are for the, um, swimmerettes that are for reproduction and the uropods, which are for locomotion. And I should probably point something out here. I don't want to confuse you too much. So let's go back up here. I don't want to confuse you at all. So here in the abdomen, down here on the tail is where you have your uropods and telson. So you have the telson here and the uropods. And so what it's doing is it's flicking that telson and the uropods on either side and it's giving it like a fan able to move, okay? Great. So let's move back to that. So you can see each of these. So just be sure that you're 
familiar with the function of each one of those appendages. All right, cool. And here it's nice because you have the internal and external anatomy that we're gonna go through a little bit more than is re represented here in the dissection. And I'm gonna get on with that because um, I think you're ready, right? One quick note though that I wanna give you is in the crustaceans, you know, uh, the abdomen, and you may wonder about crabs. People always ask me about crabs when we do this lab. What about the abdomen on a crab? Well, a crab's abdomen is much more reduced than shrimp and, and crayfish abdomen. You basically just have like this one little segment right here. And most of the animal is comprised of the cephalothorax. All right, so that is not a crustacean. All right, so this is a nice um, diagram from your book that will help you in studying for the internal anatomy of a crayfish. So let's go through, we're gonna go through this um, briefly and then I'm gonna go through the dissection. So, because it has external anatomy and just here's your rostrum, right? And it has external, right, and internal here. So let's do the internal because we've already done the external. So you have the antennal glands and I'm gonna show you this in the dissection as well. These are for, they're basically like primitive kidneys so detoxification. You have a stomach, and the stomach consists of a pyloric stomach and a cardiac stomach, and those have a couple of functions. Um, this, the, this pyloric stomach is like your stomach. It's basically, um, its function is chemical digestion, whereas the cardiac stomach has little teeth in it and is, it helps break up the food. And then you have the brain, the heart, which has ostia, right, that take blood into the heart. And, be aware that crustaceans have an open circulatory system, all right? You have the gonad before that, or I'm sorry, behind that. Above that will be a cream-colored hepatopancreas, which is also called a digestive gland, all right? And let's see, <coughs> excuse me. The hepatopancreas um, functions as a kind of a detoxification organ um, and uh, basically like a liver and a pancreas would in like you or me. All right, and then you have your intestine down here and down here, the anus, right? Well, then at the end, the, in the middle, you'll have the telson and the theropods on either side. So let's go through the dissection and then we'll end this video and move on next time, okay? Great, so this is procedure 39.2, so you can follow along. And here are the keywords you need to know. I cannot take credit for this. Dr. Jones was so kind and she's just, man, y'all, if you're in my class or hers, high five her because she has done so much this semester to try to help people, um, help folks remember things better and to really point out the keywords you need to know. So these are the structures you're going to want to be able to identify. All right. So let's watch a video together and we will find each one of these. Cool. All right. So let us do it. Let me switch to my Internet mode. Here we are. Oh my goodness, it's crayfish. Can you believe? All right, so let's look. Which one do you think is male and which is female, I wonder? Hmm. Well, spoiler, this is male, this is female. All right, let's get started. And I'm gonna skip through a little bit. He's just showing you the external anatomy here. And I should also say, I, I give you the link. I give you the link um, here in the PowerPoint so that you can refer back to these videos. This, uh, this man does a wonderful job of um, going through the anatomy really well. I just like to explain things. So I'm going to talk over him for now. So he's, he's pointing to the carapace. There's the abdomen. He went all the way down to the telson. All right. He's showing you that similar to the uh, meristomata, these crayfish have that little that joint. All right. So that, he's showing you how hard the carapace is. Right. So let's skip just a tad here. He's turning it over to the ventral side. So obviously the kilopeds here. Right. Walking legs here. Now, ooh. Yep. Walking legs. Do, 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 do. Hello, my honey. That's terrible. Don't do that. Okay, so here you see the male's first swimmerettes, and you notice the other swimmerettes are much smaller there, right? So you can really tell that first set of swimmerettes, first and, first and second there, large and in charge, right? 
great. Now I'm speaking up the female to show you the difference, which is such a good idea. All right, so he is pointing out that, well, actually, I think he's pointing out that the female is smaller than the male, showing you that first set of swimmer mets in the male that is used for transferring gametes. See how, um, how stiff and large those swimmer mets are. That's how you tell he, that that is a male. She, this female, does not have those tough swimmerettes, those stiff swimmerettes. They're all just those nice hair-like swimmerettes. I'm going to move just a little bit because he's going to open up the animal. And we're going to let him do that. All right. And just, he's showing you the feeding structures, I think, first, though. They're a little tough to see. But he's wanting to show you where the mouth is. So there's the mouth. Right. Uh oh, all right. No problem. We got this. Move on just a little bit. Maybe that'll help. Ah, here he is. Ah, okay. So here he is showing you on the underside of the telson. Oh, so this is a really great point to show you. Here, so abdomen, telson, you're in the middle. Telson, your opods. He is, that's, man, okay. That's the anus. Not delicate about that at all, are we? No. And he, so these animals have a complete digestive tract because as you were just shown the mouth, you also have just been shown the anus. So there is a complete digestive tract in the crustaceans. Now he is going to cut up the dorsal side of the animal. But we'll skip a little bit, but I do want you to see a little bit of how this works. So you go underneath, um, kind of stick those scissors underneath. Um, you want to go Telson, but then you kind of, yep, move all the way up. So you stick it right underneath that antenna or the abdominal segment once you get through the telson. And a lot of the times when we dissect in class, honestly, we will we'll really focus up here on the cephalothorax. And while he's opening, I'll just tell you, crayfish are notoriously difficult, at least I have found in my experience, um, they're a little bit difficult, especially preserved crayfish can be difficult to dissect because their organs sometimes get a little bit gooey after a while. Um, when I was teaching at UCA, it was really nice. We would actually keep crayfish alive and then um, gently, gently put them to sleep. And so that you had a much nicer animal to dissect. Um, but this, what he has here in this video is actually pretty good. All right, so let's let's move ahead a little bit. He's gonna he's gonna open that little crayfish up. Oh, all right. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, it's so beautiful. I can't even believe. All right. So he's opening, taking off the carapace there. So look at that. Oh, I'm just gonna let him do it. He's gonna show us. <gasps> look at those feathery gills. Those are the gills. So important for gas exchange, right? And the gills are on the inside of the carapace. And so you might think, well, golly, doesn't water have to pass over the gills? Well, yes, it does for gas exchange, right? But watch, he's going to move the walking legs. Oh, my gosh. Okay, watch very closely. And it's hard to tell here on the, um, whoop, well, whoops, on the preserved animal. I think he just took off a walking leg. But those walking legs are actually, they, they're fused where you, when the walking legs move, the gills move and so the gills are moving forward and behind like up and down through water and underneath the carapace so that gas exchange can occur so basically the gills are being kind of fanned through the water as they walk and if you notice they're very feathery in appearance that is to increase surface area because you want high surface area relative to volume because that allows for peak gas exchange right that allows oh look how those are beautiful and feathery so you have lots of surface area for oxygen to pass and as those walking legs move that 
They move through the water. Um, the gills basically are sloshed in oxygen-rich water, rich water, and gas exchange can occur. Really lovely. Got a really nice animal here. He's taking out the other part of the carapace. All right, there you are. Ah, mm. so if you, any of you have ever eaten a crayfish, you've eaten the abdominal muscles. So here, here, right? And if you notice that little white tube, I think he's gonna pull it up. Oh, no, nope, now, so those are, that's the abdominal muscles. And here, there you go. That is the intestine, all right? So that is um, where it connects to the anus there from the stomach. And we're not going to see the stomach in a minute, but that is the intestine. I think in this video he calls it the intestine, which, I mean, there's no way to, wrong way to say it, but it is interesting to hear. So you can watch the video. He's going to pull this up now, though, and show you, uh, I think we're going to be looking at the stomach area. Let's just check it out. All right. Filling back those gills. Oh, okay. Fill back those gills, yeah. Oh, oh, what are we going to find? <gasps> Wait a minute. Oh, all right. There he is. Oh, it's the heart, you guys. Kalima. The heart. There it is. There is the heart. It's, oh, all right. Let me point to it. Right there. Right there. That, that, that. You're leaving the heart. Oh, here's the heart. Oh, look at that. Oh, he's, he's poking. The probe is going into an ostium. So here are the ostia. All right. So blood moves into the heart through the ostia. All right. And remember, crustaceans have a an open circulatory system. All right. So the, the organs are bathed in blood. All right. But here is the heart with the ostia. Great. We're gonna let, yeah, he's going to open the animal up a tidbit more. And now we can see, ah, so this is a male. So in the male, this is the testis. But in this location, regardless of the sex of the animal, will be the gonad. So if you have the heart, right behind the heart is the gonad. And it's this kind of yellowy cream color. And so since this is a male, this gonad will be the testis. And obviously there are two. So he has testes, one on either side. And just anterior to that, I know that's what he's pointing to now, is also a cream-colored organ, right? Goes over here. And it, it takes up quite a bit of the animal. Um, so behind, slight, a bit behind the heart, you'll have the, the gonads. But what he's getting at now, just a second. Yeah, there you go. That is the hepatopancreas, right? Also called the digestive gland. Right, and this um, secretes digestive juices, and there is, and there are some metabolic regulatory properties to it too. So now we're moving up to the stomach here. So a crayfish stomach area is a little tough sometimes when you dissect a crayfish. So again, crayfish have a cardiac and a pyloric stomach, and it's a little bit hard to differentiate. But he is actually going to show you the teeth of the cardiac stomach. So the pyloric stomach is responsible for chemical digestion. But here are the lovely teeth of the cardiac stomach. All right, cardiac stomach. And again, the pyloric stomach secretes, has that digestive, chemical digestion, and just very similar to uh, chordates like us. Well, and, and many other animals that practice um, extracellular digestion. So that was the stomach, and you saw the teeth of the cardiac stomach. He's going to pull back the stomach. Yum. Oh, now, oh, guys, here we go. We're about to see some brain. Oh, yes, so can you see there are the teeth? Oh, okay. Well, those were the teeth. So. Here, oh, nice. So here's the brain. All right, so you have the ganglia, nerve cords leading to the brain. A 
of you. It is a small brain. No shade to the crayfish, but you know, it's, it's a small brain. And okay, you have to move back. Yeah, oh, great. Man, this guy's like reading a lot here. This is the uh, antennal glands here and here. So we have brain and then antennal glands. They're called antennal glands. I'm also called green glands. So those are the same thing. Antennal glands are green glands. Green glands uh, are essentially kidneys for the crayfish. Okay, so they serve in detoxification. And I think earlier I was talking about the hepatopancreas. Um, and I think I mentioned detoxification. I mean, there's somewhat of a purpose of the hepatopancreas, but most of it is with um, secreting digestive juices. So I just want to make that clear. I don't want to, um, to steer you wrong. Sometimes I say things that it's like, I'm videoing, I'm, you know, I've got to correct myself right now. Oh, yes. So now we're going to pull up the abdominal muscles. And here you'll see, it's hard to tell. Usually right here, you'd see a ventral nerve cord. I think it's probably still left in the animal. If you'll just, let's skip, skip ahead just a tad here. So we're going to look at the ventral nerve cord. Ah, here we are. Yes. So this is the ventral nerve cord. It was left in the animal. So it fits right there into the abdominal muscles. This is the ventral nerve cord, right? And you'll see the little the balls. Those are ganglia. And what's really cool is in a, um, a lot of these animals, the ganglia, you have ganglia for each segment, so they control that particular segment. Beautiful. Thanks, crayfish. We appreciate your service. All right, so that is the crayfish di dissection. Um, if you have any questions about that, please, please feel free to ask. I'm always happy to answer questions about that. So if you don't mind, um, we didn't go through, so the esophagus is behind the mouth. This video doesn't show it very well, um, but let's just go through this briefly to make sure that you know what I'm talking about and where I'll refer to it. All right, so that mouth, where the, the, from the very beginning, he kind of sticks his probe in the mouth, right? And then the esophagus, let's go this way. The esophagus, all right, is going to be behind the mouth. All right, now let's, I just want to, and I'm going through each of these because I want to just be sure you get it, okay? The cardiac and pyloric stomach. So here you have the stomach. So the cardiac stomach, cardiac portion of the stomach, so that's the portion of the stomach that's actually more anterior, and it has those teeth that aid in breaking up the food. The pyloric stomach, still part of that whole stomach complex, is um, is for chemical digestion, all right? Great. So teeth, you'll find those teeth in the cardiac stomach. You saw the abdominal muscles down here, right? The intestine is, when you're looking at the dorsal view of the animal, it will be, that intestine will be couched within that abdominal muscle. It was what we saw there at the beginning of the video. And again, like I said, I'm reviewing this just to be absolutely certain you know everything that we've gone through. Um, so the rectum. So the rectum, the video showed the anus, which is that outside opening. Um, if you were to go a little higher up, um, so here, so you're, intestine, right? There's the anus is the opening, but right above that, that part of the intestine is the rectum. It's its own structure, actually, I shouldn't say, but it's the, the, um, the rectum is the part of the intestine right before the anus, right? Obviously the heart with your ostea in the heart. The ventral nerve cord runs along this way. That's what you're seeing there with all those ganglia. And a ganglia is just a bundle of nerve, a ganglion, I should say, is a bundle of nerve cells. The hepatopancreas, all right, is right here. And this, um, this diagram calls it the digestive gland, so it's, been, it's called both. Um, digestive gland and hepatopancreas is the same thing. It's a cream-colored organ that is important for digestive, secretes digestive juices and does have 
somewhat of a tox, uh, some of a bit of a detoxification, um, or like xenobiotic metabolism. Uh, that's what I mean to say, a metabolic, a metabolic function. But the main thing you need to know is digestion, and that helps if you remember digestive glands. Okay, because the big detoxification organs are the green glands. All right. Then you have your gonad, which will be behind the heart. And it's cream, more cream colored. So if this is a testis, it's a male. But in a female, it would be an ovary. Okay. And then the green gland, the anterior here, right below the brain. Right. And obviously there's the brain. And the green glands, that, those are the primary detoxification organs. And they function like kidneys. Okay. Great. Detoxifying the blood in that, oh, and again, these animals have an open circulatory system. All right. So. That's all for now, but that's not all of the arthropods. So I hope you will come back. I hope I did not take all of your life away just talking about crustaceans and and uh, chelicerates, but they are so fun, right? Wasn't that fun? All right, so go out, maybe catch a crayfish and put them in a, some water and come back and we'll talk about insects. All right, great. Let me know if you have questions. You can um, either you can email me. If you're in my class, we do our Google Meets once a week. You can totally do that. If you're not interested in hopping on our Google Meet to ask me a question, that's fine too. Um, just email me and let me know. But I, Dr. Jones, if you're in her section, she knows about all this stuff too. But I'm always happy to answer questions because these are some of my favorite animals. So part one of two is done and I will see you later.